Hello again, this is Lecture 29. I can't believe we're already at Lecture 29. Uh, in this lecture, I'm going to cover two kind of major topics. Each could have its own lecture, uh, but when I teach it in the classroom, I bring in one um, speaker who works for a company that sells both respirators and hearing protection. So uh, what he does is he does a lot of demonstrations. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to I'm going to use two different uh, lectures and then uh, lecture slide decks, excuse me, from OSHA. And then I'm going to review what I provided to you on the link. Now this one could go on and on and on. And so what I'm going to try to do is really focus on the basics. So I'm going to be going pretty quickly through these slides uh, and then just trying to, again, trying to keep it to, you know, the real, the real basics, the real basics. And so there, yeah, they always talk about numbers and stuff like that. I think what I may have to do, and I just recalled it, is I'm gonna have to bring in the uh, NIOSH uh, information about hearing loss, how it affects you and things like that. Because what NIOSH says is that work-related hearing loss is 100% preventable. Um, I agree for that for the most part, except for when there is a, uh, an unexpected explosion uh, or something falls over, you could have a noise level that could do permanent damage. But those are very rare. So, um, yeah, let's get to, so the ear anatomy, I guess basically what, what I want to show with this, or maybe what they wanted to show is that the way the body, um, senses sound is that, uh, pressure, air pressure, changes in air pressure come into our ear, uh, and it interprets that it processes it into an electrical signal. So it goes from a mechanical to a electrical signal to our brain and the way it works is if you have if you're exposed to high levels of sound pressure high levels of noise either an instantaneous really high level or high level over a long period longer period of time the we, we have uh, tiny hairs cilia I believe is what they're called within the uh, cochlea and when those hairs get, those are what are sensing the different pressures and we and then convert it into electrical uh, sense of electrical signals to the brain. That's how we, that's the hearing process in humans or in most mammals, I should say. Um, those hairs, if they, they can get damaged. They can also be damaged through infection, but we're talking about noise related hearing loss here. And when those hairs get damaged, they don't, regenerate, they don't recover. So that's considered a hearing loss. You'll never get it back. Um, it's just like when the, when like a part of the lung is damaged, um, you don't get it back, it doesn't regenerate. So you have a decrease in the, in your, in the individual's capability for the ear to sense the, the difference in air pressure, sound pressure, uh, and convert that to um, signal. Now, some people actually, when certain hairs get damaged, um, cilia, excuse me, uh, it, it causes a, a, a signal to be constantly given to the brain in the form of a very high-pitched ring. So when things are completely silent, you can still hear this ringing. That's called uh, tinnitus. I have that actually. And how I got it, and I only have it in my left ear, is that when I was in high school and I used to mow the lawn, I would put on, I put a headphone on my left ear and leave the other one off so I could hear other things. So as I'm being exposed to actually a high level of noise, I cranked my, my um, Walkman, <laughs> big cassette thing. Uh, and um, that really high noise over time gave me tinnitus. And I mean, I, I would do that in other activities as well, crank noise in one ear and leave the other one open so I could hear. So here are the cilia, these are healthy cells. This is what happens uh, when they get exposed to noise. They actually get damaged and don't regenerate. Hearing loss is mostly pain, painless, um, unless it's an instantaneous, permanent, progressive, yes, and very preventable. So when, uh, when people put um, earphones on or earbuds and they crank the sound, uh, especially when there's a noisy environment, they're doing damage to their ears and they may not know it. One way you know if you're damaging your ears is if after listening to music uh, and you, you know, take them off or you, you go and engage in a discussion and things are kind of muffled. Or uh, one thing they had, they had said to, like if you've ever been to a, a concert, a music concert that's really, really loud, and then you know you go home and it's really quiet and you hear ringing. Um, 
Or you get back into your car and you turn it on and, oh, the thing is blaring, but when you drove home it didn't feel like it was blaring. Yeah, those are all considered temporary threshold shifts. Permanent threshold shifts is when you do permanent damage. So just like everything else, uh, every occurrence really deserves its own individual assessment. You need to evaluate uh, what workers are being exposed to as far as noise, uh, both from a task or job related and then like a full shift. The PELs are based on full shift, but uh, there are some considerations for a short term. And actually the standard itself breaks it down that you can only be exposed to different levels of noise for different amounts of time safely. Uh, the limit being 141 decibels. Anything over 141 instantaneously will do damage, and then you know it, it pars on all the way to the point where the rule of thumb is 85 decibels over an eight-hour period. At that point, you're part of a hearing conservation program, according to OSHA. Uh, 29 CFR 1910, 95. Uh, the other thing I was going to say about that, shoot, is that, um, oh, as an industrial hygienist, the way we determine when we need to start doing sound level meter, so it's like surveying, walking through with a sound level meter, is that when you're standing next to someone and you have to raise your voice so they can hear you or they have to raise their voice so you can hear them, that usually is an indicator that you're right around like an 85, 80 decibel area. That's what we use. And so I'm gonna go through things pretty quick. So here's a basic, um, uh, breakdown continuum. So over 140, yeah, you tend to have a threshold of pain there. That's super, super loud. Uh, you can see jet takeoff, um, discotheque. <laughs> How old is this? <laughs> 1970s? Uh, okay. <laughs> noise mesh, our units are decibels or dBs. Uh, if two people three feet away must shout or hurt. Yeah, okay, they actually put that into the presentation. That's just a rule of thumb we use in IH. Uh, if you're, so the sampling, you set your, so once you walk around with your sound level meter and see what levels are above the 85 continuously, you then, um, you do eight hours or sh full shift sampling with noise dosimetry. So it's a microphone that clips here, uh, it gets attached to their belt and it actually logs everything they get exposed to, including if they're yelling, that'll actually go into it as well. And... It, it, it's pretty technical and I don't need you to memorize because it can be like a, a five uh, decibel cycle or a three decibel cycle. Um, as long as it, it detects, you know, accurately your uh, exposure on an 85 uh, decibel uh, limit and on a 90 or plus decibel limit. Yep. There it is. So if you're under 85, no action needed. If it's greater than 85, equal to or greater than 85, you're part of a hearing conservation program. Um, and then over 90, it's uh, mandatory hearing protection. And this has the EPA and the NIOSH stuff. Here's the breakdown. This is for the five dB doubling effect. Eight hours is at 90, four hours 95. See as it breaks down in 15 minutes at 115. So let's see here. Workers must also go, if workers are being a part of the hearing conservation program, then you need a baseline audiogram. Uh, you can, they can either go to a clinic or sometimes they have vans that can be actually go to a company. And it's, been, it's like putting on mic, you've probably done this in some way, shape or form before. You put, over, put on headphones and you're usually in a soundproof booth. And um, what they do is they, they give you tones and you like raise your hand depending on what ear it's in. And so they, they take, your, uh, uh, how well you can hear in each ear. And so you're supposed to do that as a ba at a baseline and then every year thereafter to monitor whether they experience a, a threshold shift in their capability to hear. Um, there's also age-related noise um, uh, hearing reduction. Uh, if people have been listening to really loud music and stuff like that, that can also contribute. But if you monitor the work environment, you provide workers with protection with uh, hearing protection or actual sound deadening equipment uh, to keep them below that uh, 85 threshold for eight hours, they're not getting any hearing loss at work. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, this is some... This is a basic audiometric testing they're showing here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talked about tinnitus, I talked about that already. 
Standard threshold shift is STS. I think they talk a little bit about notification if someone is test for it. This is all in the other documents that I shared with you. <laughs> and uh, a little while ago uh, in the lecture about IH, I actually shared when my students and I had done some noise monitoring and the recommendations that came out of that and the costs associated with those types of things. So each one of these hearing protection have an NRR, noise reduction rating. And in order to determine which is the one you need, so let's say somebody was tested at 93 and you want them to, you want to get them below the 90. So that you need a minimum of three noise reduction rating, three. Uh, you probably want an eight to get them to below the 85, just to be safe. Um, so let's say you have a, an earplug that's rated at like 30. You're thinking, oh wow, that, that's great. But what you're supposed to do is break it down. What you do is you divide it in half and take away seven, or is it take away seven, divide in half? It's take away seven, divide in half. And that's what you're supposed to use. So a 30, take away seven is 23, half is 12. So you would still want, you'd want that 30 to bring it down. Uh, muffs have different, uh, what should you put over the ear? Muffs have different ratings. It all depends on how well it fits, you know, how well it's uh, containing the ear and protecting it from noise. And now they've got noise canceling headphones that are capable of being, um, uh, connected to Bluetooth so workers could actually listen to music at very low levels. Yep, yep. Okay, good. So those are the basics I wanted to cover with noise. It's preventable. Um, you need to assess for it. And when you choose the equipment, you, again, whatever the noise reduction rating is, you take away seven, divide it in half. I believe that's correct. So again, so if you had a muff that would give you say 25, take away seven is 15 divided in half, it's only seven and a half protection. So that's a very, that's just above the 90 for an eight hour period. Um, and, you, and you may have to do some calculations as well. And the standard 1910-95 guides you uh, in how to do that. All right, let's look at the uh, respiratory protection, which is much more complex. And there's actually uh, more information about this and OSHA has more information too. We'll look at that in just a moment. So before you assign uh, a respirator to someone, you have to do two things. One, you have to assess what they're being exposed to so that you choose the proper, you select the proper uh, resp respirator for them. Second, you have to evaluate them to make sure they're healthy enough to wear a, a respirator. I guess three is you have to make sure that the respirator provides a seal and so you have to do a, um, a, a fit check fit test sorry fit test here's the different elements of 1910-134 so ideally you do engineering controls some sort of local ventilation or containment so workers don't have to wear a respirator but that's not always possible I should have said that with hearing conservation. It, it's better to put in noise absorbing or noise deadening or isolate uh, loud equipment so that workers don't have to wear hearing protection, but if they do, you know, that's what you gotta do. And if you look at the, when I did the uh, plant walkthrough a few lectures ago, which was the initial assessment before we did the noise monitoring, you can see how it just wouldn't be possible. So when you're working with like sanding, grinding equipment, or using air to clean things, compressed air to clean things, it can get loud. Um, and sometimes it just can't be done. So, here's different types of tight fitting. The quarter mask I've never seen. Half mask is pretty typical. Uh, this is a reusable mask. So it's not like the N95s, which are disposable uh, face coverings. Uh, and you got the cassettes and the cassettes designate what it's removing from the airstream. You've got the full face piece. So if you need eye protection in addition to respiratory protection, that's when you do the full face piece. It also achieves a higher protection value. Nobody uses the bottom right one. It's kind of crazy. Hoods mean that it's going to be under positive pressure. So everything you breathe is, it, there's always air being forced out even when you're inhaling. Uh, you got the helmet provides some actual head protection along with not requiring you to have a, a tight fitting face piece. 
loose fitting face piece. Those can be used for either supplied air or power, uh, air powered air purifying respirators. Um, and then they got the full body suit, typically not seen. Here they're showing you know a breakdown of the or an opening of the cassette. This is a filtering face piece or an air purifying respirator, half faced. Canisters aren't used as much. Um, they have more surface area, so they can be used longer. Um, but they're bulky. They're heavy. Uh, people tend to not to like to wear them, um, and so that's why we tend to go with the smaller uh, half face. A negative pressure respirator means the, you know it's when you breathe in, what it's doing is it's forcing air through the filter cartridge itself. This is a filtering face piece. This is an N95. There's N. There's P and there is R. Um, N is non-resistant to oil. P I think is partially resistant to oil and R is resistant to oil. And what I mean is like oil mist, oil in the air. Because they can gum it up. Here's an air purifying respirator full face piece. You know, again, the cartridge dictates what it's filtering. So it's not just particulate. Um, it could also be gases. There are certain gases that actually can be removed as long as it's not above a certain limit. And you got to make sure that there's enough oxygen in the air in order to use an air purifying respirator. Otherwise, the person would um, suffocate, right? Positive pressure respirators, that's where you don't need the, the tight seal and you're feeding in air. It's either a, a pump that's uh, filtering the air or a supplied airline, so a compressed air source, or you're wearing an actual tank carrying a tank with you, like it's called an SCBA, very much like scuba, but you're not going underwater with it. Here are the different things right here where it's forcing air in. They're more comfortable. Sometimes the air can be cooled. Um, they're more expensive though, and they're a little bit more bulky than the half face when it's air purifying. So uh, there's continuous flow, there's demand. That's usually for an SCBA. So it's not constantly running, but as soon as you start to breathe in, it, it replaces it. More expensive, heavier. Okay. Showing here, supplied airline. Um, if you're gonna be going into a space that could be dangerous, you also have to have a 15 minute escape tank on your hip. They're not showing that here. Here's a self-contained breathing apparatus. You have to know how to you know, read the, uh, the dial and there's gonna be an alarm at 15 minutes so you get out of the space. Here's the escape only I talked about. You have to develop a written program. So it all starts with assessing what they're being exposed to, uh, assessing what would be the required respiratory protection, right type of respirator, if you can't design it out, if you can't ventilate it or control it. Respirator, uh, evaluating whether the worker can wear it safely, healthfully, making sure that there is a, either, either there's a tight seal if it's air purifying, otherwise it, you can just wear it, um, and then training them. And this all goes into the written program, site-specific. Needs to be updated as there's changes. It should be an annual retraining for workers. Make sure they still understand everything that needs to be done. There should be a designated program administrator, usually the safety person. And workers need to be trained to properly store, inspect, wear, um, repair if needed, clean, especially with those air purifying respirators. Uh, it, you achieve a seal because of the uh, a rubber flexible that goes around and you wouldn't believe what accumulates underneath those flaps. It's gross. So you need to use like an alcohol wipe or disinfectant wipe to clean those out. Or you can use soap and water if you know how to take it apart. Uh, let's see. If, if a respirator is not needed but a worker chooses to wear it, they want to wear it for their own safety, they do still have to be evaluated to make sure they can wear it safely because a respirator puts extra resistance, stress, on your respiratory system and your pulmonary system as well. And if the person has a pre-existing condition, that could exacerbate it. And then they could go into you know, some sort of fit uh, while wearing it. And it's your responsibility to make sure your workers are safe. And so you can't allow them to wear something that's gonna make them uh, sick or, um, again, exacerbate a pre-existing health condition. And there's stuff they need to fill out from Appendix D of 1910-134. Again, they have to be medically able to wear respirators, so you do that health evaluation. May have to do a spirometry test, which a lot of people call pulmonary function test, but I guess that's not the proper term, in which you, um, they put on a face piece and you have to, they check your lung capacity, basically. And it's, it's not painful, but it's uncomfortable. 
because, I mean, they want you to basically empty all the air from your lungs, and that's hard to do. We're not used to that. Selection, evaluation, fit test, use, maintenance, care, breathing quality and use, training, program evaluation, all things we kind of talked about. Talks about here about the selection. I've gotten into it. Needs, okay, all respirators are NIOSH certified. If you have something that does not have the NIOSH certification on it, it's not considered a respirator. Just telling you. If you're if if the area in which you're going to be needing respiratory protection has IDLH levels of a toxin, immediate danger to life or health, you must um, it must be a supplied air, and there needs to be some sort of emergency, and it should be monitored as well. Those are typically confined spaces. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Anything below 19.5 is considered oxygen deficient. We had talked about this when we talked about confined space entry. Um, if it's below 9.5, you have, they have to supply their own air. You can't use an air purifying respirator. Here they are. It's airline or a tank. Uh, still talking about IDLH. Assigned protection factor. So each respirator has an assigned protection factor as per its NIOSH certification. You gotta make sure that for whatever level of an air contaminant that's there, the protection factor keeps them below a PEL, keeps them safe. You also, if you're using cartridges, you need to have a cartridge changeout schedule. Uh, you can either look at the capacity of um, capture of it and calculate it yourself, or now some cartridges have a colorimetric indicator when they need to be changed out. But that needs to be identified in the training program. Here are the different assigned protection factors. See, where's the full face piece? Full face piece is 50, half mask is 10. For a papper, it's 50 and 1,000. Okay, interesting. Maximum use concentration is something you have to calculate. You take the protection factor times the OSHA limit. That's the maximum they can be exposed to. And you so therefore, again, there's more air monitoring. This is very much tied into what we talked about with industrial hygiene. I don't know why I said it that way. End of service indicators, talked about that. Some have them, some don't. You may have to do some calculations on your own, but it has to be identified and workers need to be trained on it. All right, so it talks about the certification requirements under uh, 42 CFR Part 84. Uh, let's see, it talked about the N, R, and the P. N, non-resistant, R is resistant, P is proof. I think I was close to that, maybe not. Go by what it said there. That's for oil particulate though. For HEPA, high efficiency, uh, it's tested and needs to be set at 99.97% at 0.3 microns or 300 nanometers. Compared to the COVID, I believe the COVID, uh, I don't remember how big it is. I thought it was like in like, uh, it's below the 0.3 micron. But they say that due to, um, what do they call it? Uh, sort of static electricity or electrical attraction, the things that are smaller tend to get attracted to the material within a, a HEPA filter as well. So it's supposed to be have a high efficiency even under that as well. But they only test it at the 0.3 microns. And they usually use saccharin. Saccharin tends to be at like a 0.3 micron. If you've ever had saccharin, a sugar a substitute, and it becomes airborne, it's very dust-like. And it kind of floats in the air. It exhibits Brownian motion, which is like a gaseous motion through air or whatever. Uh, you have to be checked out by some sort of licensed healthcare provider, the MLQ evaluation, you know, it kind of looks into your health history. Sometimes they test you. Then you gotta go through fit testing. Make sure you get a seal if it's air purifying. Uh, that's very different than the seal check, which you do every time you put it on. So the fit testing can be either qualitative or quantitative. The qualitative, you put it on, you go through a battery of movements and talks trying to break the seal. And then like here, it looks like a nuisance smoke, which I don't think you can use anymore. Uh, but you can use uh, acetyl acetate, which I think is called banana oil, saccharin. Um, I'm not sure what else. So that's qualitative. And then it relies on the, uh, the subject to indicate whether they can taste or smell uh, while they're doing it. Quantitative is better because it takes out the subjectivity. What they do is they connect uh, a tube to the mask, they go through the battery of movements, and it measures both internal and external particulate levels, and that's an indicator of whether it's a good seal or not. 
So the best is quantitative. And I know like uh, Moldex, that's the rep that comes in and usually covers this stuff. They'll do that for free for you if you're actually buying their respirators. And I think 3M may have a similar deal. Okay, isomeal acetate, banana oil, saccharin, Bitrix. I forgot about the Bitrix um, for the qualitative. For the quantitative, they do stuff that's already there. Uh, the fit factor is the concentration substance outside divided by the concentration inside. <laughs> Yeah, so you want at least, yeah, it all goes into APRs as well. Uh, then you do the seal check. Seal check is basically two things. One is put it on the way it's supposed to be, feels comfortable, because you had fit tested it before. Cover the, in, cover the inlet and suck in, and the thing should suck into your face, as it would. The other is cover the exit valve and blow out, and it should bulk. It should kind of come out a little bit. As long as it stays sealed while you do that and you get that general motion, that means you have a good seal and now you're ready to go. If you're wearing corrective lenses, you may have to um, wear a full face uh, and they may have to be mounted on the inside. You gotta make sure it doesn't break the seal and you gotta be shaved, like clean shaven um, for at least a half face and a full face. There's the positive and the negative check. Got to make sure you're always inspecting these things, cleaning the things, storing them in a clean container or bag. That's how these things get cited quite a bit, is that workers forget. And you can't just take out a respirator and throw it on the table. That's, it's going to fill up. The inside is going to become contaminated. Um, and so it, does, it should be cleaned regularly, stored in a clean place. Talks about firefighting, maintenance and care. You, typically, you can take them apart and clean them. You got to be careful, though. You don't want to damage it. So sometimes an alcohol wipe is all you really need. Here's the breathing air quality. This is grade D, gives you the limits here. Compressor supplying breathing air must be, I think, oilless, right? And these have a filter on it. Uh, there you go, there's the oilless. And there should be an alarm on it. Here's a canister, it's NIOSH approved. You should go through training annually. People get new masks if they have a massive weight change, so that it changes the configuration of their face or their health conditions change. You gotta make sure that, uh, you should evaluate it before you do the training each year to make sure that everybody's still comfortable, they're still able to wear them, they're storing them properly, they're cleaning them. Uh, assess the air quality, see if it's changed at all. Maybe you'll find that, oh, we got this new way that we can contain or ventilate or change out a chemical so it's not so toxic. And maybe then you don't need the respiratory protection program. It, it costs quite a bit of money and takes quite a bit of effort to administer a, uh, a respiratory protection program. It refers to 1910-120. So if you do any medical evaluation, workers get access to it. And you do, you're doing that to see if they're capable of wearing a respirator. And if you're monitoring the air quality, they also need to be educated on that. We're at 28 minutes. This has gone a bit longer than I'd wanted. I'm just going to quickly go over what I have here for you. So I went over the two presentations. I've got three different OSHA documents I want you to look at. One for hearing conservation, one for respiratory protection, and one that's been updated for the use of N95s in this time of COVID-19. There's an OSHA hearing conservations topic page, which is very good, and you can find these documents there, or well, the hearing conservation one. There's also a uh, OSHA respiratory protection e-tool. These are meant to kind of guide you through, develop things. And there's also a topic page, just like the topic page for hearing conservation. I also provided some bonus lecture slide decks. Two of them are from my friend who usually does this lecture from Moldex, and the other is the lecture I give in Safety 380 on this topic. I believe that's really everything I'd wanted to cover because we've gone so long. Now we're 29 minutes. Please take a look at all this stuff. Go to the OSHA website, check that out. Um, and you can take a look at the slide decks as well. There's a lot of pretty pictures there and everything.